Start in the last session of the day. Uh, we got uh, two presentations to go through, and then we'll do a, uh, a little panel uh, discussion at the end of the day. Uh, so the first presenter is Jules, Jules Erbach from uh, Otoy, doing some really fascinating stuff, I think, in the whole uh, light field, uh, VR, uh, streaming, display. You, you're doing lots of very interesting things, and we want to hear about that. Thank so you. please tell us. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Um, light fields are a very interesting field of, uh, of both research and, um, and product for us, uh, especially with the emergence of, of HMDs, you know, that are across VR, AR, and now mixed reality. Um, you know, as we look ahead, you know, to the 2020s, um, there are certain things that we feel are going to be fundamental aspects of media uh, in that decade. Um, synthetic rendering is an important part of it. People think that capturing the real world and streaming video is a lot of what's involved in this. I think that, in fact, you know, our mission is to get things from the real world into CG and then render that in a specific way and then stream that out into some holographic or volumetric form. Um, by doing so, that actually means that the value of the content is going to be much greater. You can edit it in real time. You can have persistent uh, metaverses and worlds that can be modified. And, um, and so, yeah, I mean, we've been thinking about the uh, content creation pipeline and how that's going to work realistically. Um, a lot of the content creation uh, is going to happen on the cloud. Uh, in fact, one of our first investors was Autodesk to help them bring Max and Maya and their tools uh, into a web browser powered by Amazon servers. And we've been doing that for many years now. And so a lot of our rendering and a lot of the processing that we do happens in the cloud. But we can also stream the data once it's been generated in a light field or volumetric form. Um, but that doesn't mean that the client is going to be super thin either. We've been experimenting with uh, GPUs on, on local machines that are getting you know, doubling in speed every year. And recently we worked with PowerVR on ray tracing hardware that I think um, is going to fundamentally change what you can do on a pair of thin uh, glasses. Um, so our mission is to democratize the content creation pipeline. Um, we do a lot of work and we start with a lot of um, high-end studios and, and partners uh, like the Smithsonian or Disney. Um, some of our technology uh, on the capture side actually won an Academy Award in 2010 for our work on Avatar. And if you see Disney movies like Avengers, um, you know, it's all using our capture technology to get you really high-end CG assets uh, that can then be synthetically re-rendered. So we really have um, three different parts of the company, and one is related to capture, the other is related to rendering, which is Octane, which I'll be going into in a little bit. And the last piece is Orbex Media, which is this open spec that we built. Um, it's just XML and JSON and a number of other open formats that we validated that can be used in two ways. One, to give you an interchange format that can be used to actually render a source scene. And then the second part is the output of that uh, rendered job, which can be uh, in OpenGL shaders and JSON and other things that can be consumed easily, including in uh, JavaScript. The rendering part of what we do is probably the most important and fundamental piece of, uh, of, our, of our part of the pipeline. Uh, we have a product called Octane Render, uh, which has been out for five years. It is incredibly uh, good quality and it's very fast uh, and it runs entirely on graphics cards, which has been a very novel workflow for a lot of uh, artists. Uh, this is what Octane can do on a desktop machine. In fact, my laptop can render this at four, fr uh, four minutes a frame. And you can see that this entire scene is totally synthetic. So if you were to try to do a light field representation of this, um, it, it may not look so great if you try to do it with, a, with real cameras. It's almost better to get a sense of the scene and then have a tool like uh, Scatter, which is what, one of our, our utilities that can generate an entire world for you. And then you can drop in uh, characters and objects that are scanned in with LightStage or some other capture system in there. Uh, in the real world, um, anything that's done in Octane, even though this is showing you a 2K render, can also be turned into a panoramic or VR render or a light field uh, next year, which is what we'll be you know, showing. Uh, some of the recent work that Octane's been used on, if you guys are familiar with Westworld, the opening, done in Octane. It was actually done uh, by three artists on a couple of GPUs, and they, they just did a, uh, you know, there was an article written about how easy it was for them to use the, you know, the tool, because basically in Octane what you see is what you get. Um, but what's exciting is that, you know, we can see the openings of shows and, and, and media itself. I mean, anything that's already being rendered uh, can be turned into a volumetric system. And as we've expanded the ecosystem of Octane plugins, which integrate into all the tools that people use, including Photoshop, more recently Nuke, um, there really isn't uh, any application today that doesn't allow you to touch this pipeline. Um, we have more plugins that Octane has integrated than any other uh, renderer out there. 
And the important piece of those plugins is not just that it gives you this rendering quality, it's that it exports and imports this interchange format. Orbex exporting is in Photoshop, it's in Houdini. So things like things as diverse as physics simulations, all these things can basically be saved in this interchange format. And the, the reason we did that was so that if you wanted to do high-end rendering, you can decouple the authoring tool, whether it's Houdini or After Effects or even, in this case, Unreal Engine, from the actual render job. And to that end, when users uh, can generate content, they basically send that Orbex scene file to Amazon. We render it as a panorama or an image or a light field, and then you get back a URL that you can use to download uh, the image or stream it. And the, uh, the discovery that we made uh, doing work with Oculus last year, uh, we powered their entire 360 Photos um, content with, with, uh, with Octane, and these are some of the renders that were made by users, was that we really need to have and think about volumetric content as being a, almost like a JSON list of different um, formats, because depending on the device, you may have position tracking, you might have, you know, I just brought a pair of prototype glasses that have 2K in each eye at 120 hertz, so whether you're rendering a still or video or something that's immersive or composited, uh, it's important to have multiple resolutions. So the Gear VR, the stereo cube maps that we made uh, for Oculus with our tools were uh, 18K by 1536, which was a 12 uh, image strip format that we created with John Carmack, who's the C2 of Oculus. And that's what the um, uh, current 360 Photos app ingests. Uh, but as you get towards the next generation of Gear VR, which will probably have a 4K screen, these will double to 24K, and then with the prototype classes that we're testing with, that, you know, it's 72K, 16 times the number of pixels. So really, we want to be able to generate all those formats in the cloud and then give you a link that is uh, based on the user agent of the web browser giving you the right asset. Um, and on that front, we've actually been working on getting the Orbex media format integrated in many interesting places. So initially it was Oculus 360 Photos. Now we've actually worked with Oculus on ingesting um, a, you know, a, a web browser with Orbex media for environments in Oculus Social. And we had launch partners like Disney, which just a couple of weeks ago, uh, their websites are now enabled with this for the environments. And, uh, and, and shortly, Samsung's internet browser will also support it. So we've given the source code for the media format to Oculus, to Samsung. In fact, we've shared the, you know, the player um, with them, and we want to do that with more uh, endpoint partners so we can get this integrated everywhere. Um, the Orbex format is really simple. Um, you can see here from an artist's perspective, you have just a simple series of nodes that give you physically correct materials, assets, and objects. Within, the, um, within that format, there is a, um, you know, a specific set of meshes and textures we support, like GLTF, which is an emerging uh, spec. And when the media format is, is exported, whether it's a panorama or a light field, it can do it in this similar kind of layers that you have in compositing software. So when we're doing those environments for Disney, where the Disney web page was lighting up the Magic Castle, really that was happening because there was a lighting layer that was generated with, the, you know, with this uh, spherical render or the stereo cube map that was able to then modulate the lighting in the viewer. So these things are all just JSON uh, connections that pull down uh, various images. And you know, as we get towards HDR displays, we want to have everything done in linear space. And we built codecs that handle that. Um, but as you get towards the next generation of devices that have position tracking on untethered mobile, that's where things get really interesting. So this is that scene with the um, artist actually doing a camera fly through. But what we've been developing, and this is where the light field um, format that we've been working on comes in, is we want to be able to generate an entire cube of this room and have you just have one single image that you can, you know, a volumetric image that you can just walk through at this quality. And, you know, that's something that we actually did build. Um, we showed it at SIGGRAPH in 2014. So, for example, this scene, which is one of John Carmack's favorite renders, um, in light field form streaming, it's able to, you're actually able to get a three megabit uh, stream and a portal appears where you can actually look into that scene and it is generating on the server, it's generating that frame at about a millisecond from pre-computed data. And roughly speaking, uh, we built a codec that is uh, X, Y, and Z in time uh, and it's, uh, it stores a cubic meter of, of this volumetric data in about 35 megabytes, which is pretty small. Um, but it's actually still probably too large other than for still to, to send down over uh, LTE. And we can use this for all sorts of you know, things, not just volumetric light fields, but we can also then send down very high resolution uh, stereo panoramas. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool, even with AR, you know, which is more forgiving when you have marker-based tracking. Um, and uh, we felt we really had to sort of push the envelope. And this is showing uh, you know, a more recent version of our streaming system in the Gear VR um, with a uh, lighthouse tracker attached to it. 
And I'm actually moving the, uh, the holographic stream, but this is actually being sent over a three megabit stream. And you can also see there's transparency, there's depth information, which means that even if there's a poor connection, the depth and the transparency can be used to do local reprojection. And in fact, Oculus has now built that with, um, into positional time warping inside their platform, which is pretty cool. So we have the tools already to be able to generate and, 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 and basically stream these volumetric experiences. Um, but as we really look forward towards where the devices are going to be in a few years, um, you know, the ultimate resolution is, is going to be the equivalent of 16K per cube base. And right now, we're about a tenth of that. Um, but I think that based on what we're seeing with these, the density of these um, screens, it'll get there in a few years. And, um, and again, we wanted to have a, a toolkit that was really, you know, that allowed you to be able to do compositing and editing. So we can actually take multiple light fill streams um, even on the server and composite them together and you end up with something that is almost like a, a game engine which is in fact why we want to have an Unreal Engine and Unity integration so that you can create interactive content and blend these together like you would a simple mesh. Um, I want to fo probably focus on the last part of this uh, discussing some of our approaches for capturing um, the real world which uh, you know there's, there's many different approaches. This is um, Paul Debevic's uh, proposed giant one gig, uh, one gig, uh, gig array light field capture system. And in fact, Lytra has ended up building something very similar to this, which is awesome because that's yeah, pretty much the, the brute force way of getting light field video. Um, what we've discovered though is that we, we probably want to separate scene capture from, from human performance capture. And so a scene like this, which was actually done by one of our artists for the Oculus 360 photos, competition. Um, I mean, it looks beautiful. This is a real world, um, you know, scene in, in, in Tokyo. Uh, he just took a bunch of photos and used um, photogrammetry to generate a mesh and then used our tools and software to make it look real. And Octane is able to spit out a full volumetric um, light field of this, which you can then navigate through uh, as a portal. And it's amazing. I mean, the, you know, the, the size of this is, is, you know, you can, you know, have it be basically be a bird's eye view, and the detail is, is phenomenal. So he only actually you know, captured a few leaves and, and trees, and with the scatter tool, he was able to populate that pretty much automatically, which, which is a great way of showing what somebody can do in a weekend with a, with a camera and our software, but we'd like to make that more automated. And in order to do that, we want to take a lot of the technology that's been used at the high end for light stage, which uh, has been typically for movies and high end games, um, and, and put that into consumer devices. And we've figured out the minimum viable version of that is to basically have uh, two, two lenses polarized differently, but at 120 hertz, we're able to capture albedo, normal, uh, normal maps, um, glossiness even, and with that, you can feed that back into our rendering pipeline and generate really high quality uh, synthetic imagery. Um, and similarly, when we can do, you know, look at a piece of metal and get the uh, index of refraction, we have a database in Octane that is able to replicate that. Um, in the simplest sense, um, without going to Paul's crazy, uh, you know, 400 lens array, we can spin a camera around, and as long as we know where the camera viewpoints are, we can generate um, inside of Octane a, a synthetic light field um, with refractions and everything in there. And this is really inexpensive. I mean, this is something we could give to Zillow, uh, and they can use that to capture light fields of their environments. Um, but ultimately, we, we feel like capturing humans and capturing performances is critically important. So that's why we've been working on a, a portable light stage rig. The first test of that was scanning in the president uh, for the Smithsonian. And since then, we've, we've gotten the rig to be smaller. We've actually brought it uh, and set it up at SIGGRAPH. Um, but the quality that you get is, is phenomenal. I mean, there's no system in the world that can capture an 8D reflectance field other than light stage, which is why we've you know, licensed the technology from USC and commercialized it. And this is what you get out of it. You can actually relight the, um, you know, the data that you're capturing with light probe. And the, the current um, resolution of LightStage is awesome. I mean, it, you're getting poor level details, eyelashes in CG. And this was a few years back with very expensive um, you know, vision research cameras. We took a test to show that it's now a $15,000 rig. We can take the data and we can bring it into Unity with our plugin. And you can see here that lighting is being changed with the Unity uh, UI. And it's fantastic. I mean, this really is the tool chain of the future. Simple tools like Unity, maybe even simpler ones like React, which Facebook announced for the web. Um, connected to our rendering and cloud services, I think is a really important component. And you know, the vision that I really do have is that we want to try to get to the point where there's almost no pre-computed assets at all. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we, we want to develop technology that empowers um, you know, an unbiased uh, live rendering approach. And uh, I don't know if this will 
Right? This is Brigade. So Brigade is a experimental branch of Octane. This is going to be rolled out into the next version of our render next year. But this is super fast. This is able to actually do full unbiased path tracing in real time. It's using a bunch of servers on Amazon, um, and the cost is $20 an hour to give you this stream. But what's phenomenal is that when we started to test PowerVR's ray tracing hardware, this is, this is about 250 million rays a second, and uh, requires a lot of rendering power to do that. But PowerVR's uh, ray tracing chip is 2 watts and is able to do just about the same, uh, which is amazing. So a 120 watt version could do 6 billion rays a second, and that's enough to render reality live. So we're excited to see that roll out in the next two years. And all these pieces together really provide um, a good roadmap for the future for content creation and publishing and streaming. Thank you. What was that company that, that's, that's doing that new chip? I missed that. Uh, PowerVR. In fact, they make the uh, graphics chips for the iPhone. So we probably, half of us probably already have uh, their, their GPUs inside of our phones. Um, but they've also built a specialized ASIC that does ray tracing. And we can do ray tracing on a GPU, but this is about 10 times faster for the same amount of power, which is pretty crazy. Okay. Okay, who's got a question? Come on. You've got to have a good one for them. That's a fundamental part of what we're doing in this stream. So the streams that you were seeing um, with that head that was in the Gear VR was just the um, one lighting basis condition. But as you guys were seeing with light, light stage, w even when we're capturing a human, that woman that you saw after the, um, you know, with the, with the light probe, that is from just a 180 degree or 360 degree field of view. A simple light probe could be used to relight that stream on the client. And that's, in fact, critically important for the goals of companies like Magic Leap that want to have perfect mixed reality um, where you have reflections uh, that are cast onto the scene and also the, the object itself is lit correctly. And in the case of things like skin and things with subsurface scattering, we're sending down uh, the basis lighting conditions as part of that stream and that allows you to relight and composite that locally with the um, incoming light of the, uh, of the environment. So in Square. Yes, and there's in, in the layers that we're sending down, we're sending down index, index of refraction, subsurface scattering information, um, rough specular roughness. So you have your, your Times Square light probe being fed into the viewer. It'll actually, you know, the, the, the eye will actually have a very sharp reflection of whatever's around you. The skin will be lit correctly with all the bounce lighting in, built into the, um, into the output uh, of that. And it's a very cheap operation. It's just a very simple compositing step, but it'll look perfect. And that's pretty much what LightStage has been used at in production for, uh, for taking a CG character and putting that into a uh, real world scene. Um, but we want to bring that into the consumer market through uh, 8D light field streaming. I mean, it's essentially VRDF data, isn't it? Exactly. Um, you have the reflectance field, not just the light field. And so, you know, light, 8D light field includes not just every point of view, but also every point of view with every possible incoming ray direction. And some of that has to be baked in. Uh, yeah. Some of it can also just be in the VRDF if it's high, high specular reflection. Okay. Uh, per cube face. So there's there's. You know, what is a cube? What is a cube? So a, a cube a, a cubic projection map is different than you know the typical longitude latitude panoramas. It basically divides the unit sphere into six faces. If you're in the center of a cube and you don't move and you look around, it looks like you're you don't see the edges of the cube. So that is a higher precision format um, than spherical, and you don't get any distortion at the poles, which is why we typically. Yes, 16K by 16K in, for 90 degree um, field of view in front of you, with spherical or cubic, but that's, that's where things are, are moving towards. As opposed to equirectangular. Yeah, uh, an equirectangular version of that would be uh, 64K by 32K, okay. just to give you an equivalent of uh, what that would be if you're just taking a normal panoramic movie. Gotcha. 
So I'm not sure I understand fully what uh, ORBX is doing, but um, is this a potential candidate for for standardization within MPEG and J or JPEG? Yes. So we we've just joined the uh, JPEG uh, working group on um, JPEG Plano, and we've um, you know we've been talking to, to that group about submitting all of ORBX as a at the very least the metadata that goes into the media format that gives you all the information about how the um, you know the image was generated, and then also the scene format. Those are the two pieces that there's just nothing out there that seems to do that. And we've been working carefully on the scene format itself being open, an open standard that Disney and any rendering pipeline can use. Um, and the other pieces that we we're thinking of contributing are our light field codecs, which are all GPU based. So when we're decoding and encoding light fields, we're doing it all in G uh, OpenGL compute shaders. Um, and these things are definite candidates for the spec. So we're excited to do that and contribute Orbex um, to the specification and see it turn into something um, you know, that's adopted everywhere. Love it. Any other questions? Thank you, Jules. My pleasure.